Many of us are familiar with scripture and know that the body of Christ is one of the most familiar ways we hear the church being described by St. Paul and now others. Now when I come to the end of a page in an exciting book, my arm raises my hand, my fingers bend, grab the page, and turn it. And there's not much that goes on that I'm conscious of as I turn that page. It's almost as though it turns itself. Think about scratching your nose or taking a step. It just happens. However, when evening approaches, Stan and I, and sometimes other people, put a lot of worry or deliberation and maybe thought into where and when and what and with whom to satisfy the hunger that we know is coming. So there are some things that go on up here in planning our dinner. That's at least two ways that my body works to get what I need to survive and to live happily. Now if the church is Christ's body, might it work in a similar way? I think we're all able to think of the times when we sat and worried and deliberated and talked about what we should be doing in God's name. How to spend that money, where to go, who to choose, most of you are familiar with that. But might there be times when we, the church, just do God's work without a lot of thought and deliberation, kind of like turning the page or scratching my nose? How might that work here at Shepherd of the Valley? Take a step back. Last week, we heard the echo of Jesus' encounter with the challenge to his authority by the temple hierarchy during Jesus' last days in Jerusalem. And then we heard that soon after his crucifixion, the same question in almost the same words is asked by the same people in the same place to his disciples as the church begins to go about its necessary work and mission. We talked about that as an echo. What happened to Jesus happened to the disciples. Now today, we will hear the echo about the response of the church to concerns defined by Christ, like our bodies respond to our needs. So hear the word of the Lord from Acts 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken away from the earth. That's Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself 
or someone else. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. <coughs> then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azostos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. A chance encounter? Let us pray. Lord, your word is precious. It has been preserved for generations, centuries, millennia. And it arrives here this morning by the power of your spirit. So we ask that you would move these words of yours into our hearts and lives that we might be changed. That what you plan for us and need from us might be done for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right now, many Christians are asking this question. What would Jesus do? The assumption behind that being that if we know the answer to the question, we will know what we should do to honor and please God and to complete our part of the covenant we've made with God. Remember that covenant? We would accept the redemption God offered in Jesus Christ and we would give our lives to God for God's purposes. Stated it like that. This is a blessed and valid way to direct our lives and thoughts. What would Jesus do? However, we live in strange times, as has everyone through history, and Jesus has not laid out a clear direction for the choices that always confront his followers. Is smoking, drinking, and swearing unchristian? Should we pray aloud blessing our food in a crowded restaurant? How much time is too much time on the internet? Is an internet Christian fellowship valid or even possible? Should schools <coughs> teach about the relationship between the Garden of Eden and dinosaurs? <coughs> what about redefining gender? Is that something the church can know how Jesus would respond? I believe we are in untraveled areas here. Thankfully, our teacher, Jesus, left us the Holy Spirit, not a road map and not a set of rules. There were incidents in Jesus' life where he frankly did strange things spoke not at all like I would imagine he could or even should, went places that certainly surprised his disciples and the folks around him. Remember when Jesus described God, <coughs> the Father, as an unjust judge in the parable of the desperate widow? Remember when he deviated from a critical journey to visit the home of a Roman centurion the leader of the soldiers who had defeated and invaded Jesus' home, country. <coughs> Remember when he disrupted the work and worship of the temple of God? So I wonder if Jesus even surprised himself as he followed God's direction by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus was fully human, with the same mental and historical boundaries that limit our behavior and words. So in light of these thoughts, let us examine this event in the life of Deacon Philip, the one we have just heard. Philip is not an apostle, and probably not one of the 
many disciples who listened to Jesus and observed him as he went about his father's business in Galilee and Judea. Philip now is clearly a follower of Jesus, but he's a Greek. And he was made a deacon when the church faced division over the equality of care for the Greeks versus the Jewish members of the Jerusalem church. Clearly, he is filled with the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus promised all his followers. And we find him in this uh, reading of scripture, first, preaching in Samaria with people who are eagerly listening to his message. Then came some new instructions to Philip. Scripture says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. By the way, if you want to, if you go there today, you can walk on that same road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, Philip is doing a fine job preaching and evangelizing in Samaria. God is being honored. What is this all about? Has Philip really heard the voice of an angel? See, this is where it all gets tricky and strange. What would Jesus do? How sure is Philip that this is the voice of an angel and not an urge of his own or from some other source? How will we know that voice? How will we know it's God's voice? Well, like us, Philip had probably heard about the chance encounter of Jesus' disciples on the road to Emmaus, following Jesus' resurrection, and the amazing rumors that were floating around Jerusalem. So I'm going to quote now from Luke 24. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were discussing with each other all the various things that had taken place. They were struggling to understand with each other. <clears throat> Jesus himself approached and walked with them. Their eyes, though, were prevented from recognizing him. You're obviously having a very important discussion on your walk, Jesus said. What's it all about? He stood still, a picture of gloom. Then one of them, Cleopas, by answered him, you must be the only person around Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on there these last few days. What things, he asked, and I'm going to skip down, to do with Jesus of Nazareth. You are so senseless, Jesus said to them, so slow in your hearts to believe all the things the prophets said to you. Don't you see? This is what had to happen. The Messiah had to suffer and come into his glory. So Jesus began with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them the things about himself throughout the whole Bible. They drew near to a village where they were heading. Jesus gave the impression that he was going farther, but they urged him strongly not to. Stay with us, they said. It's nearly evening. The day is almost done. And he went in to stay with them. As he was sitting at table with them, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and who were saying, Is it true? The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. Back to our question. How do we know it is our time for a chance encounter with God's Holy Spirit. How can we know when to follow the thoughts, ideas, and urges that come into our hearts and minds? Well, one, we have it on very good authority, Luke's careful search, 
that Jesus met two disciples on the road to Emmaus who were sad and confused about all the events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection. Opening the scripture to them, Jesus, in this chance encounter, sent them on their way rejoicing, knowing that he was alive. Two, on the same basis of information, Luke, we know that Philip encountered a God-seeking Gentile on the Gaza road, struggling with Isaiah's prophecy. After hearing God's word explained to him, he was baptized and went on his way with joy. Three, we have encounters with God's spirit directing holy incidents in our lives and in the lives of others. Dr. N.T. Wright, a theologian from England, tells about one night he was in Cambridge, which he didn't, where he didn't usually stay, and he was sitting studying and he just kept feeling, go to the even song at King's College. Now, Tom Wright really didn't want to go to Evensong, and if he were going to Evensong, it wouldn't have been at King's College. So he sat there, and he kept thinking, I need to go to Evensong at King's College. So, tired of being irritated, he got up and went to Evensong at King's College. And it was very crowded, but there was one seat at the back, and so he sat down there. And the service had just begun when a hand was put on his shoulder and he turned around and here was his friend, Bill Farmer from Dallas, Texas. And Bill said, what are you doing here? I didn't even know you were in the city. I have been looking for you. I am putting on a conference and I need you to be a speaker. So he went to the conference and he spoke, interestingly enough, on Isaiah 53. And he says, as he taught on Isaiah 53, God really blessed him. Most of you, I think, have a story of when you just felt against all reason you ought to do something. Usually, I hang around and think, uh, maybe you don't, but when you do, often it's a miraculous encounter. So I will tell you about my most miraculous encounter. I was leaving a meeting in Monrovia and driving, and as I got out of the parking lot, I just thought, I need to go see my friend who's a pastor at Monrovia Presbyterian Church. I thought, that's really dumb. She's probably not there. I need to get home. I don't want to do this. And as I drove, I thought, well, I'll drive by the church, see if anybody's there. I drove up and I kept think, hearing, thinking, go in the church and look for Jean. Go in the church. And I didn't want to. So I drove, being me, I drove past the church. And then I thought, oh, this is not good. So I get into Bond's parking lot, found a telephone. This is in the old days called the church and said, Jean isn't there, is she? And they said, oh, yes, she's here. Oh. So I got back in the car, went to the church, went in, and said to Jean, I don't know why I'm here. She said, I am so glad you're here. I have been feeling so alone and broken. And God sent you to me. Wow. So are you ready for this? Sometimes, you and I need to just do as Jesus did, and as Philip did, and as Christians have done over time, and changed history. We need to put our trust in God to know where, and who, and when, and how we are to speak, or touch, or listen, or love, or minister as God's servant. Our challenge is to do as Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He listened and obeyed. We can
and trust God to be with us and protect us. And we can listen and obey. This morning, we have an opportunity to begin that process in two different ways. The first one is that we have been given some little children on Friday nights and Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 o'clock in the morning. These little children have come to church. Will they be met with God's word and God's stories and God's Bible verses? God may be speaking to somebody to say, what about it? Trust me. This is your call. But then there may be some of us who are saying, I really like to pray for people. It's scary. I don't know what, what this is about. But today we are beginning prayer after the service in the pastor's office. We are inviting those of you who are brave enough to say, you know what, I'd like you to pray for me. But we're also inviting some of the rest of you to say, I'd like to come and be there and pray along with what's going on. Are we listening? Will we act? Some of you will act today. Sadly, some of you are more like me, and you're going to wait till next week, or the next week. But I hope you'll take that step. God may be calling you to a position in the church, and you say, I am not qualified to be a deacon, or an elder, or a Sunday school teacher, or a choir member, or whatever. Is that God's voice? Because I can almost guarantee that if you do, you will be blessed and very probably somebody else. This is scary stuff. But why would you come here to just sleep? Let's come and be scared and do something new and exciting. New beginnings is already beginning. So let's go. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you don't just leave us comfortable and happy, but you challenge us. However old, however tired, however sick, you take us one more step toward glory, toward joy, toward the healing of your world. And we're so thankful. Remove from us, Lord, we ask all the ways that we know how to say no or I can't. And open us up to realize that you are living within us and you can speak to us. And you are. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now I'd like you to stand up, please. And we're not going to read the Apostles' Creed. We're going to do the Old Roman Creed. And then we will sing our hymn. So would you stand up? And it will be on the video for you. Remember, a creed is a promise or a pledge of who we are. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, But the Pilate, Pilate was crucified and buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits on the right hand of the Father. Whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, the life of the now we will sing number 129.
resources that are available to us. And as we step out the door, we go as God's servants into a world that is hurting and longing for the touch of God. Do we believe that? If so, let us go. Blessed by God, healed by Christ, empowered by the Spirit, we go as God's servants. And now may grace, mercy, peace. From God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be and abide with each one of us. And all we love and all we pray for now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen.